and welcome to the Global Tennessee Podcast and the Global Dialogue Plus uh, video recording. We have a special episode today uh, with Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon, who uh, is Ambassador of Colombia to the United States. Uh, welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. We, uh, we have posted the, um, the Ambassador's uh, uh, distinguished uh, biographical uh, details and achievements and postings on our uh, notes. Uh, but let me say that uh, the ambassador is in his second posting as ambassador of Colombia to the United States. He previously served in Washington uh, and uh, is back for another tour of duty. Um, he has a distinguished career in uh, political, public, and private uh, life. He has been the defense minister. He has been involved in uh, development uh, of the uh, uh, private sector as well in Colombia, and I, I suggest that uh, you look at his uh, biography. Uh, it is a very distinguished career, uh, including the time he spent as defense minister, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the experiences there with uh, the FARC rebels and, and so forth. But uh, he is here in Nashville, Tennessee, to talk to uh, a business roundtable about the commercial opportunities uh, between Colombia and the United States. Uh, we've uh, had a free trade agreement with Colombia, and uh, the ambassador uh, very eloquently uh, addressed uh, to a, a roundtable uh, the opportunities for business development. So, Mr. Ambassador, I, I have a laundry list of questions here, but after listening to you so eloquently uh, talk about the relationship between Colombia and the United States, uh, I would just like to uh, uh, put the floor open to you, and, and starting with uh, where you did, talking about the 200-year relationship between Colombia and the United States, and uh, identifying some of the little-known uh, facts in that relationship that most Americans uh, would not uh, know had you not shared them with us today. Well, thank you. We are celebrating this year, starting now up to the month of June, 200 years of diplomatic relations between Colombia and the United States, 200 years of a strong relationship between our uh, both nations. I think that Colombia has become the best ally of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, and the United States have become the best ally of Colombia to the world. And I think that's very important to be said. But this is something that has been built a long time. So 200 years ago, uh, the government of President Gaines Monroe recognized Colombia as a nation and accepted the first diplomatic attache in Washington. But since then, many, many things have happened. You know, uh, at the time, the United States was attacked at Pearl Harbor, the Day of Infamy, as it was called. Colombia, in consequence, declared war to the Axis powers. After that, in the post-war era, Colombia and the United States have worked together for the same purposes. The creation of the United Nations, the creation of the Organization of American States, the creation of the Bread and Woods Institutions, the World Bank, the IMF. Seventy years ago, we fought together in Korea. Colombian military was sent to Korea on their UN flag and US command. And we share our efforts, and those were very important. During the Cold War, we were on the same side. And by the way, we have been participating in uh, peace and observers missions in places like Sinai in uh, Israel-Egypt border. But uh, in addition to that, in the past 20 years, the United States have supported Colombia with a logic of co-responsibility. Unfortunately, cocaine criminals produce cocaine in Colombia but unfortunately for the U.S., it gets a larger part of the consumption here in the United States. And that's where our two nations need to cooperate and work together against transnational crime, terrorism, and violence. And the United States, with Colombia, have been supporting the Plan Colombia, the Peace Colombia packages, which absolutely transformed Colombia in a way that we were the most valid country by the end of the 20th century and somehow have become the standard of security, democracy, and also promotion of economic development, investment, and progress. I think that's remarkable and probably is the most regarded bipartisan foreign policy of the United States. And I underline bipartisan. 
because it was really crafted by both Republicans, Democrats, uh, in a way that uh, still today uh, continues to be effective and extremely useful. Since then, we signed 10 years ago uh, a free trade agreement that has benefited both. The United States have been able to export more to Colombia, and we have been able to raise more capital out of U.S. investors in order to uh, fund uh, our businesses, our jobs, and somehow our prosperity. In addition to that, we got into the OECD, and we have become global uh, partners of NATO. Not to forget that in the recent crisis of Afghanistan, where all the chaos was happening, Colombia was the first Latin American country that came out and said that was ready to work with the United States to help bring people out of Afghanistan and host up to 4,000 Afghans on a temporary basis. Although that has not proceeded, I think that the signal was clear and it was a strong statement. And of course, we're ready to continue to work with the United States in different issues, migration, climate change. Those are issues that are really important not to forget trade, investment, development, and of course, keep this strong relationship of national security coordination that matters very much for you know, regional security, not to tell global security. The, um, the vice president and foreign minister of uh, your country met with uh, Secretary Blinken in, uh, yeah. in Paris yesterday, and President Duque is uh, coming to uh, Washington next week, I, I believe. Uh, when uh, when our leaders from our countries get together, what what are the uh, key issues that uh, you suppose that they are talking about? I think first of all, it's very important to keep these uh, uh, dynamic and active relationship among our countries, coordinating everything as part of these strategic alliance we have, and definitely uh, the meeting in Paris was very important. Uh, everything was discussed there from migration, climate change agenda, you know, we're going to Glasgow to promote the same set of agenda between the U.S. and Colombia. And of course, uh, I think we're going to uh, have a joint conference uh, on migration to see how do we tackle this problem. You know, we have hosted in Colombia two million brothers and sisters from Venezuela. We're very proud to be offered uh, to them a TPS. Uh, but at the same time, we've seen more people coming from Haiti, from East Asia, uh, from different places, and they are trying to get to the United States. What is the best way to confront those challenges? Definitely by promoting growth, economic development, and prosperity in nations like Colombia that allow uh, these people to integrate and to have a better life. And not to forget the need, of course, of uh, you know millions of Colombians to be able to have a better job, better opportunities, and you know better standards. That's the way we see it. And uh, of course, we also speak on trade and investment. President Duque will do a good tour in Washington as well and in New York, mostly to discuss on ways to finance uh, the climate change agenda. Colombia has become a, a leader in Latin America for uh, the energy transition efforts. So we are increasing our efforts and attracting investors for uh, solar energy, aeolic energy, geothermal, and not to forget we recently put together uh, a whole package of regulations that put Colombia very high in the list of green hydrogen and blue hydrogen investors to the future, which might be not only a good decision to keep and save the planet, but at the same time a good decision to create jobs and economic opportunity. How, uh, how do you say the uh, relationship between uh, administrations, you've been the ambassador uh, previously, and we now have a new administration in Washington, is there any uh, difference in the character uh, of the relationship between uh, Colombia and the Biden administration compared to the previous uh, president's administration? You know, what have been our success in the relationship with the United States is being friends of the United States not of one party or one group. We are friends of the Democrats, the Republicans, and frankly speaking, with the government of the United States that uh, the people of the U.S. decides. And we have worked together. I've been working with four different administrations, with the uh, Clinton administration, 
Bush administration, Obama administration, Trump administration, and now Biden. So we feel very well working together. And by the way, President Biden, we have to recognize that he has been very substantial for Colombia. So he was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at the Senate when Plan Colombia was crafted. Then as Vice President, he support Colombia uh, to get the free trade agreement with the US. Also, uh, he was uh, putting together the Peace Colombia package, supported that as well, and uh, he launched in Cartagena, in Colombia, the US-Colombia Business Council at the time. So the connection between uh, the US and Colombia is uh, absolutely uh, a friendship, and as I said, bipartisan, and with President Biden, uh, well, we know he's a special one because of what he did for us and with us in previous years, in previous times. Compared to many presidents, he does have a lot of foreign policy experience. He you knows, and he has experience in Colombia, too. Yes. Uh, you mentioned a couple times Peace Colombia and uh, Plan Colombia. Uh, for our uh, audience that may not know the specifics of that, can you provide just a little more details what that means, what, what the elements are, and what the impact has been? has been substantial impact. It is a package that every year Congress has been approving, mainly since the year 1999. Uh, we get funds in Colombia, in essence, to support security capabilities in order to protect population, in order to increase uh, the protection of human rights, and of course, to defeat transnational crime and share uh, threats that we have with the United States with cartels or with terrorist organizations and you know sometime also to coordinate to bring efforts to bring peace and stability to the region. At the same time there is a very strong soft approach mainly led by USAID that implies strong investments on development of Colombian rural communities or communities in need and that's something we value very much. So these packages have been moving forward and Probably that has what has strengthened the relationship between Colombia and the United States and makes this so special relationship. But at the same time, it brings Colombia from being a, a failed state, a country known in the past only for violence and crime, to now being known as the longest, oldest democracy in Latin America and the most thriving uh, economy, not to say uh, democracy in the region and that's what we will want to continue to be. We are not out of challenges, we have challenges, we have problems, but that's why we need to keep having these kind of support and packages to keep increasing the human rights protection, to keep increasing the advancement of our democracy, our institutional framework uh, uh, strengthening and not to forget trade, business and jobs as a big opportunity to really offer people you know, uh, money in their pockets and freedom and opportunity. Let's turn to uh, the commercial relationship between Colombia and uh, the United States, especially Tennessee. There's been a free trade agreement in effect for uh, 10 years now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the tangible benefits of uh, the free trade agreement and what that means vis-a-vis uh, -vis our relationship as opposed to other countries that don't have an FTA? Well, both our countries have benefit. Our people, both countries, have seen the results. Exports from both countries have grown. Uh, in the case of the United States, you benefit a lot in exports. Now you have a positive trade balance. So the U.S. is exporting more to Colombia than we are exporting. But although our exports are growing in areas different of uh, oil and mining, especially in agricultural products and uh, other industrial products that we are advancing. But on the other side, Colombia and U.S. have benefited on the investment side. American companies have come to Colombia, have established, have been able to create jobs in Colombia, and of course, our country has benefited of that American capital, you know, coming to the country and allowing prosperity to move forward. Before COVID, we were able to cut in 15 years poverty by half in Colombia, and all this is very much related to this economic uh, thriving and performance. I think we know that COVID hit all of us very hard. It had a major economic consequence in Colombia, everywhere too. 
And of course, in our case, it, it brought a lot of people to unemployment. So we need to recover the economy. And the way to recover the economy is attracting more investment, creating more jobs, and frankly speaking, allowing uh, the government, in the case of Colombia, to do more social programs in order to raise the level of those who are in need and that really require some kind of support in our country. And also taking development to marginal areas of the country as a way to really create a more peaceful and more uh, uh, stronger Colombia uh, to the future. That's a way and I think we all benefit from that. By being the best ally of the United States in, in the hemisphere, not only we promote the same values on economic freedom and uh, uh, the same democratic values, but also uh, we somehow allow the countries to receive business and trade and investment opportunities when they work together with Colombia and the United States. So that will be another perspective to look at. Well, t this morning you uh, brought with you a team from your proconsul offices in New York, Miami, and Atlanta, and uh, you and, and they are very persuasive in talking about the economic opportunities. Can you talk a, a little bit more about Tennessee, what uh, Tennessee has to offer uh, Colombia and vice versa in uh, the potential for uh, business expansion in the future? One thing that I believe is very important these days is to understand that we need to reshuffle global supply chains. And for a city like Nashville, for a state like Tennessee, it would be very important for you to have more of your supply chain coming for a certain area of the world. And that is why Colombia becomes a perfect spot, Latin America in general, for U.S. companies to bring and invest on the supply chain and guarantee the stability and sustainability of businesses. Uh, that will be key and that's something I believe we learned from the pandemic uh, and the consequences that we saw. So I believe it's something that uh, creates an opportunity for Tennessee invest in countries like Colombia, uh, establishing plants and establishing supply uh, channels uh, to the U.S. That's one part, but on the other side, focusing on what uh, Tennessee and Nashville specifically will have. I learned that you have healthcare. I learned that you have strong uh, opportunities on digital world, on music and culture, and also on uh, technology. All those four fronts will find strong business opportunities in Colombia. We are a 50 million market uh, 50 million people. In addition to that, we have influence and projection in Central America, the Caribbean, and part of South America. So you can account for a market of more than 150 million people when you think that uh, any company can establish in Colombia. So attracting those investors on areas of healthcare or logistics or technology or music and culture into Colombia that will be great. Second, we have created a set of incentives uh, in Colombia for uh, what is described as the creative uh, economy or orange economy uh, described by President Duque as, as, as I said and uh, it implies that you know music, uh, culture, art will have a good set of opportunities in a country like Colombia to establish and set up their businesses. And not to forget that uh, about uh, the future Colombia has decided to become by strategic decision a, a real leader and a world player into the uh, discussion on the climate change agenda and energy transition. So we have set strong targets to reduce emissions and deforestation by 2030, but also we have created a whole set of opportunities for uh, you know, uh, green uh, energy uh, options like uh, eolic, solar, uh, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and of course, uh, geothermal. So a lot of businesses and opportunities can happen in Colombia, and I think Tennessee should look to Colombia as we're watching Tennessee as a thriving place, as a place where a lot of things are going on, and uh, frankly speaking, I'm very impressed about it. Well, you're very kind in your words this morning about Nashville, how people said you must go see Nashville. That's what they're telling, you must see Nashville. That's what they're saying, and here we are, very impressive. Well, I, I look forward to uh, see more, more uh, relationships built uh, between Columbia and, uh, and Nashville and Tennessee. Let's turn, if we could, Mr. Ambassador, to uh, regional issues. You talked uh, this morning about Venezuela and the relationship 
Um, as, as we all know, President Maduro is not considered the legitimate president of Venezuela by the United States and has sanctions in place. Um, you, your president has called for the sanctions to continue. And there's been a recent uh, claim by the uh, armed forces chief in your country that there are about 2,000 fighters belonging uh, to rebels uh, operating from Venezuela, planning attacks and participating in drug trafficking. So how does Colombia deal with these threats and how does Colombia view uh, Venezuela, uh, as you called it, your, your Siamese brother um, earlier today? But uh, it's, it's a fractured relationship. So Venezuela is the Siamese brother of Colombia. We were born the same day Bolivar created the Gran Colombia and Venezuela was part of that. We're not anymore the same country, you know, uh, for, for centuries now, but uh, we will always be the same nation and we will have to care for each other uh, all the way. We care for Venezuelans and that is why in Colombia we establish a TPS that allow uh, Venezuelans to come to Colombia and integrate into Colombia. That's, that's a temporary protective status. That's what it is. And it's two million Venezuelans. Two million Venezuelans which, as of today and growing. Which for Americans would be, uh, let's see, 50, 12 million people arriving in, in the United States. Absolutely. It's a good way to, to, to put it in perspective. It's a lot of people, but I think it's a moral duty for Colombia to take care of our own brothers and sisters that are coming in need. They're coming out of oppression. They're coming out of a country that was a wealthy country, the wealthiest in per capita terms in the region, and became to a 95% in poverty. So we need to help there. But of course, the regime is a different thing. The Maduro regime is a violent regime. It's a regime that has you know, violated human rights, that is you know, benefiting out of the business of cocaine and uh, illegal mining that uh, is oppressing their own people and that they are being related to the foes of democracy. You know, they're very much connected with countries like Iran and others that are really not seeking for a better future, but, you know, to keep their regimes in power. Uh, so it's problematic for Colombia. For us, it's somehow existential because from Venezuelan territory under Maduro regime, uh, terrorists from Colombia still are established and of course they plan and made attacks against Colombian citizens and the interests of Colombia. So it's something we will have to keep discussing and explaining and telling the world until the day this really ends. But as you know the best antidote for that is Colombia to continue to grow, prosper and be able to integrate more people, Colombians and even Venezuelans that come to Colombia so they can have jobs, they can have opportunities, and we will keep focusing ourselves in you know, making the right thing, developing our economy, and of course having a strong stance in national security together with the United States for the good of the region and of course for the good of the Colombian people. You talk about the, the region, can you uh, expand on how Colombia is influencing the region in terms of stability and uh, the relationship uh, with the United States. What can the United States do to help build uh, on Colombia's leadership and influence in the region? There are a few things that I believe are interesting features to remind. You know, Colombia is the longest established democracy in Latin America, and that creates a very special bond with the United States in addition to those that I explained before. But uh, also has been a country that has never defaulted in its debt. So Colombia has raised to this level of respect in the Latin American uh, area in a way that sometimes becomes a model on you know, institutional development. And that's what we want to be, uh, you know, a positive influence. Uh, we are friends of our brothers and sisters of Latin America. We are you know, uh, same nations and we, res we are very respectful of every country and you know, the decisions of each of our uh, nations in Latin America, but at the same time, I think that as much as we continue to increase our economic expansion and influence, uh, offer our security experience together with the United States as we do in Central America, and continue to have a firm stance on the protection of human rights, democracy, and the values of freedom that we share, I think that that's the best way to influence and to contribute for a more stable 
uh, and more prosperous uh, region. I wish the United States can focus more uh, on the region because Latin America is a region of opportunity. And I think that if it happens, it will be definitely good for Colombia, for Latin American countries, and for the people of the United States as well. Let me uh, remind our listeners that this is the Global Tennessee Podcast from the Tennessee World Affairs Council. And on video is the uh, Global Dialogue Plus on YouTube. I'm Patrick Ryan, President of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. We're talking with Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon, the Ambassador of Colombia to the United States. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, let's turn to uh, domestic issues. Uh, you, you mentioned in your roundtable remarks that earlier this summer there were uh, major protests uh, in Colombia and in a couple of cities, and uh, there was a, a, a violent uh, reaction that, that uh, made uh, news here in the United States that uh, there, there were protests and they were attributed to uh, uh, tax reform that was unpopular, uh, inequality that was uh, claimed by activists, and uh, police brutality. And we also uh, can ascribe that to probably the pent-up a reaction to the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic that has uh, impacted the economy and, and also uh, the health and welfare of, of people. Uh, what would you like to tell uh, tell us about the uh, uh, pursuit of democracy in, in Colombia and the protests and, and what we should know about uh, the uh, internal uh, politics in your country? So in the past uh, two, three years, we have been confronted with additional challenges. On one hand, we still need to take development to the marginal areas of Colombia in order to pacify our country in a real way. We need to bring real peace, and real peace is very much related to offering uh, uh, social uh, opportunities to the people in, in, in different areas of the country. It is still is a challenge and will continue to be a challenge for a long time. This is not a thing that will just happen by a day. It will take a generation to really bring development to those areas. But then we have the two million Venezuelan scene, so we need to feed them and integrate them. And suddenly COVID hit Colombia, and it hit hard. We had a contraction in the economy, and around 3.5 million Colombians fall again into poverty. After us being able to uh, cut poverty by half in 15 years, in one single year, you know, uh, around 30% of those Colombians that were already put out of poverty fall back into poverty. So really, there's some level of social challenge right now. And what we saw by the month of April, uh, May, was initially expressions of those Colombians in need. Those Colombians that were really claiming and asking for jobs, opportunity, and somehow to feed their families. And I think we need to be humane and realistic about this and be helpful. But what was worrisome was to see some political extremists trying to take advantage of that situation, trying to claim that, uh, you know, very uh, fair uh, public expression on their benefit. So they were really creating chaos. And at the same time, unfortunately, as well known, in Colombia still we have criminal and terrorist bans they have cells, and some of those cells perform uh, the destruction, especially of the public transportation in cities like uh, Bogota and Cali, on low intensity terrorist activities. And of course, that was all these policies and seen. I think we need to be objective about all this. I think the government is right now focusing very much on providing, through a new tax reform, the funds that are necessary to take care of those Colombians that are in need. That is fair necessary and legitimate. And we need to focus on to people in need. But at the same time, we have been strengthening our intelligence capabilities and our efforts to confront those who are using violence or terrorism, trying to take advantage of those Colombians in need or trying to bring chaos for an ideological or political agenda. I think that's very important. And that's how the country has become more stable and the good news is that yesterday, actually, the World Bank uh, informed the world that the forecast of economic growth for Colombia was moved from 5.9%, which was a decent, important number, to 77 .7. And actually, we think we're going to end the year 2021 above 8%. That's very important because that 
will and will continue to reduce by month the level of unemployment. As we have less unemployment, there's more families with income. As we have more families with income, they can send their kids to school, to college, and they can start to feed their families again. That's what we need to enhance their salaries and to have more and more jobs. And this is why we are so much working hard to attract new businesses, new opportunities, and new ways of you know, getting our economy on track and strong. Talking about helping uh, people, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, the global pandemic uh, impacted everyone, uh, not just uh, economically, but obviously it's been a human catastrophe. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, Colombia had done uh, a better job in dealing with it than some European countries. Give us a sense of uh, what the situation is uh, in terms of uh, the infections, the, how, how the country is dealing with it, um, uh, doses of vaccines, uh, are there enough coming from the United States and from COVAX, the WHO organization? Uh, how are things regarding the pandemic? So, uh, first of all, this has been dramatic. I already described the, the economic consequences, but the human consequences have been dramatic. 126,000 Colombians have died out of the COVID, and more will continue to die. That we know, as happens in America. I care for those families, and I think we all need to understand the dramatic consequence of having this uh, disease and, and, and you know, how harsh it has been to our societies. On how we handle this, I think there is some recognition that Colombia was able to double the number of ICUs and ventilators uh, in a matter of six months. So probably that saved, you know, thousands of lives of Colombians, hundreds of thousands. And if we were not able to do that, probably we would have even more uh, cases and more people dying of this uh, situation. On the vaccination side, we have been, as of now, able to uh, imply 42 million vaccines already, uh, apply 42 million vaccines out of 50 million people we are. But are really, uh, you know, fully vaccinated, we already have 35% of the population. So that's, uh, that will be something uh, close to 20 uh, million Colombians, or a bit more. And we will continue on this process. There's the hope that by the end of uh, the year, we might have 70% of the country fully vaccinated. That's the target. Let's try and, and we're making that. And here, there's another reason to thank and express appreciation to the people of the United States. Colombia has been the country that has received more vaccines from the people of the United States than any other country. Six million vaccines already. With the announcement of President Biden that another 500 million vaccines will be donated, we expect another important amount that will continue to help this vaccination process that will not only save lives, but very important, allow our economy to reactivate and to bring back people from poverty and to bring back people into jobs and income. You talked uh, this morning, uh, re returning to the economic and commercial relationship, uh, with our uh, healthcare industry here in Nashville that uh, you're anxious to see more investment and uh, work in bringing pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing uh, to Colombia so that we have that uh, to look forward to. Absolutely. Healthcare has become uh, understood not anymore as a very important issue for people because I believe all of us have always understood that, but now it's a matter of national security. Pandemic is still here and more pandemics our healthcare challenges will come to the future. And only those countries that can have an industrial base to be able to produce for an emergency like the one we are uh, passing through uh, will be able to move forward. So that we know now. And it's a way to protect our countries from an economic harm and of course from human uh, consequences to the life of our citizens. So we would love to see you know, factories and plants in healthcare business being established in a country like Colombia. Of course, to take care of our national market, 50 million people and real market of 250, uh, 200 million people, but uh, definitely with the good set of conditions for investors that we have uh, defined in, in, in Colombia that I believe are very attractive to any investor uh, 
that uh, you know Tennessee or Memphis might have. Can we uh, continue with one more uh, regional issue, a, a domestic issue? The uh, the FARC or the Revolutionary Army uh, Armed Forces of uh, Colombia, which has uh, been fighting a, a a terrorist war in Colombia since the 1960s. Uh, five years ago, there was a, an agreement uh, for them to demobilize uh, the Havana Accord. Uh, you were defense minister, and uh, you took pride in bolstering the capabilities of the Colombian armed forces. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, what the status is of the FARC and the, uh, the negotiation and, and what we have to look forward to in the cessation of the, uh, the, the fractured situation there? Well, the only reason why we had that agreement was because our uh, soldiers, police, you know, sacrificed in order to defeat those terrorists and bring them to a negotiating table. And that's how, you know, an agreement was crafted. The positive side of the agreement, I think that uh, around 13,000 uh, members of the FARC were demobilized. That's good news by definition. You know, less people, you know, carrying weapons and so on. The bad news that somehow it divided part of the political establishment in the country. There is a political clash, the sense of uh, impunity at high levels or the increase on criminal businesses like cocaine business or illegal mining are somehow uh, connected to the Havana Agreement. But on the other side, the Duque administration has been implementing as much as possible on the social uh, elements of the agreement taking investment on the rural areas and creating programs in the areas that were affected by violence and that are expressed by the agreement. I think that Colombia has the need to keep moving forward. We need to not look to the past, but more look to look to the present and to the future. Unfortunately, part of the FARC is staying in Venezuela and stayed as a rear guard in some cases or in other cases as dissidents. The ELN is another terrorist organization that is there. And there are other criminal bands from drug trafficking to illegal mining that are uh, threatening our population. So we need to keep strengthening our presence in the region on both ways, social implementation of solutions for people, but at the same time, securing communities and human rights by policing and even by performing military ops against those who are foes of Colombian people. And that's something that we will need to continue to do. And of course, as much as we continue to reduce crime, violence, but at the same time, increasing income, jobs, opportunities, social solutions, healthcare, education, that's the way. And I think we need to continue to craft that to the future. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, let's uh, conclude our uh, discussion today with uh, your uh, uh, perspective on the people-to-people -people relationship between Colombia and the United States and the building of bridges. You pointed out that uh, Colombia is two hours from Miami and it's in the same time zone as Nashville, so we don't have to change our, our watches when we, when we go to visit Colombia. But the, uh, the number of Colombians who are in the United States who either have become citizens or, or work here or, or visit here, and the number of Americans who, who uh, travel to Colombia and educational exchanges and so forth. Can you give us uh, sort of the fabric? And then I'm, I'm sure you're going to talk about the New York Yankees and, <laughs> and music. But give us a, a sense of the fabric that uh, connects the two countries. So I think it's, as you said, it's people, you know, of course I can expl explain and speak about these uh, achievements that we have seen, you know, our countries fighting wars together, you know, solving uh, global policy or real policy together. But at the end, what makes the relationship between Colombia and the United States unique is people. There are, you know, millions of cases of Colombians and Colombian families that are related to the United States. They're here, they're part of the workforce, they have their kids, they are Americans already, you know, thousands and millions of them. And there are many stories of Americans, you know, sharing and having experience in Colombia because, you know, many of you have traveled. Uh, and still the country that sees more, that from which we see more people coming to Colombia is the United States. So this is a very strong connection. Let me remind you, we are only two hours distance from Miami. Barranquilla to Miami will be just a two hour flight. 
There are more than seven cities that have non-stop fights between the U.S. and Colombia. And I think that's very amazing, you know, to see, you know, all these level of connection and connectivity. And that's that's uh, maybe more flights than uh, Nashville has with uh, the other places in the United States. I think I think it does. <laughs> I think it does. And as you said, you know, we're in the same time zone of Nashville, so you don't need to move watches. And, you know, I, I strongly believe you need to, to look south. And I, I, let me bring you this anecdote. Every time I go to a college, university, uh, company, uh, NGO, I will always find someone with Colombian background, either a Colombian or an American that, you know, has a family from Colombia or an American that by some reason was working in Colombia with Colombia. The relationship is about people. And yes, you know, you see the New York Yankees and then you see, you know, a great bomber there playing. You see uh, Modern Family and you see these uh, wonderful actress and, and, and beautiful as well, Sofia Vergara, and you come to music in a place like uh, Nashville and you think about Shakira and J Balvin and Maluma and all these great names in music and culture, Fernando Otero and others that are all the way, and that for some people here in America, they don't even know they're Colombian, they just feel they are, it's, it's theirs. That's how it is, you know, as it happens in Colombia, you know, typically, the most popular person in Colombia usually becomes the president of the United States. That's something that, you know, when American presidents get frustrated, they better go to Colombia because there they will have good numbers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Ambassador, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. We've been talking with Ambassador Juan Carlos Puzon, who is the ambassador of Colombia to the United States. He's uh, on his second tour of duty as ambassador and we look forward to many great things happening between our two countries under his leadership. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Let's celebrate these 200 years in a big way and celebrate people, celebrate our nations. Thank you. Excellent. This is the Global Tennessee Podcast and Global Dialogue Plus uh, video broadcast, and you can find uh, the Ambassador's biography in our details, and I encourage you to take a look uh, to see what uh, he has achieved, and we appreciate his uh, eloquent comments uh, today. That's it for us. I'm Patrick Ryan with the Tennessee World Affairs Council. Have a great day.